Welcome to the Philos Project Podcast. I'm your host, Dominique Kaufman, and this is a weekly news podcast where I bring you headlines from the East for a Christian audience in the West. This week, I am honored to be joined by my friend, Farhad Razai. He is our senior research fellow here at the Philos Project who specializes in quite a few things, but in Iran specifically. So welcome, Farhad. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you. So today we're going to be talking about the United States uh, attacks in Iraq and Syria following the Tower 22 drone attacks committed by Iranian-backed militants, which unfortunately took the lives of three U.S. soldiers and injured dozens in Jordan. And this comes on the heels of a lot of tension uh, fueled by Iran either directly in the region or indirectly through their proxies over the last few months since October 7th, but really January, there was an uptick in provocations from Iran. We saw Iran directly missile their neighbors, Syria, Iraq, and Pakistan. Um, Since October 7th, even 160 operations have been carried out against US forces in Iraq and Syria. And then of course, there's tensions with the Houthis in Yemen and in the Red Sea. Earlier in January, the United States and the UK targeted key Houthi uh, outpost in Yemen in a military attack um, after over a month and a half of indiscriminate violence from the Houthis, who are an Iranian-backed militant group out of Yemen. So Farhad, uh, we need your help understanding what's happening in the region and what all these stories mean. They might seem independent, like the Houthis in the Red Sea, we have you know, an attack in Jordan, but they're really all connected. Um, So if you could help us understand what happened um, in Tower 22, why Iran backed this attack that killed U.S. soldiers, and what the U.S. response is, and then even putting into context how this affects the Israel-Hamas war. So the first thing I want to ask is, why is Iran antagonizing the region through direct provocation and through their proxies against Israel and the United States? Well, Dominic, thank you very much for this question. Um, I would say there are two components to this issue. First of all, antagonizing and mobilizing and destabilizing the Middle East, uh, either directly or through proxies, is a working model that the Islamic Republic has established since 1979. And they use this model, they use this uh, this, uh, proxy war to gradually increase their domination of uh, the uh, the region. I mean, this is the traditional model to use proxies and provocations to dominate the Middle East. The second thing has to do with the Abraham Accords. They have opposed the Abraham Accords because they feel that It has knocked them down and fatally harmed their project of domination of the Middle East if a coalition uh, formed with Saudi Arabia. So the Abraham Accord, as we know, was first published under Trump administration, and they understood that uh, this is a mortal danger to their domination. Then there was this breaking news that Saudi Arabia was ready to join the Abraham Accords and the Iranian regime could not tolerate that. For the Iranian regime, this coalition of Israel and the Arab countries would be an absolutely fatal blow and uh, uh, it would erase most of of, uh, what they have done during these Uh, 45 years. So these are the two reasons why the Iranian regime uh, set up aggression to Israel and to the United States. Mm. And what role, because you mentioned, you know, maybe one of the reasons the October 7th attacks happened was to spoil a potential normalization agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. How should we understand Iran's role in the Israel-Hamas war? What's the context there? Uh, Well, we have to look at Iran for the same reason that I have mentioned. Hamas was a very important part of the proxy alliance with specific tasks of uh, harassing Israel. This is not something new. Since Hamas took over Gaza after the 
the Israel, the Israel withdrawal in 2005, and then in 2007 when Hamas kicked out PLO uh, from Gaza. At this point, uh, they became very valuable to Iran in, in creating this so-called ring of fire and the axis of resistance around Israel. And uh, uh, the, the Hamas attack on October 7 should be viewed as a major effort on the part of Iranian regime, on the part of the Quds Force, the IRGC Quds Force, to mobilize proxies to hinder the Abraham Accords and uh, uh, to hinder the probable joining of Saudi Arabia to the Abraham Accords. So that went wrong, not because Hamas was so successful, but because of the catastrophe collapse of the Israeli intelligence and the, and the Israeli uh, military setup system around Gaza. They never counted on having such a great success. All they wanted to do, I mean, the Iranian regime and, and Hamas wanted to do was to, ki to kidnap few hostages, uh, probably to release their own members uh, in the, in the uh, Israeli prison. They never really expected to have such a big success. And this was only because of the total collapse of the Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military and, the, and also the surveillance system. Also, apart from that, we know that Iran funds Hamas, Iran arms Hamas, and it trains its members in, in Lebanon where, through the, uh, the uh, Hezbollah members. So the Iranian regime does all these for Hamas to take on Israel. That's another reason to look at Iran to understand the current Israeli-Hamas war. And we see the Houthis also in the Red Sea taking on this fight against Israel, of course, the reigning indiscriminate terror on a bunch of cargo vessels. So how do the Houthis fit into the Iranian access of resistance and that war or fight against Israel? Well, Houthis are also part of the Iranian axis of resistance. I mean, from the time that Houthis took over Sana'a and they deposed the, uh, the let's say, sideline, the, the Houthi legitimate, the, the Yemeni legitimate government, uh, then the Iranians counted on them, they armed them, they, they fund them, they trained them. I, I heard the, there were reports, intelligent reports, many of the Houthi members were trained in Iran and in the IRGC University of Imam Hussein. So um, they're also part of the axis of resistance. And now the Iranian regime, as I mentioned, they armed them, they fund them uh, to, to take on Israel. And their aggression in the Red Sea should be seen as a part of the Iranian regime to harass Israel, to, to encircle Israel as a part of that so-called ring of fire and to disrupt the uh, to disrupt the global trade so that the international community and the, and the United States would pressure Israel to a stop elimination of Hamas. So Farhad, this requires a bit of speculation uh, on your end, but in your expert opinion, do you think Iran is seeking to, you know, impose um, more hardships against Israel to strong arm them into some sort of a ceasefire through their proxies? Or do you think they seek to provoke the United States to maybe a larger regional conflict? Because we see um, with the Tower 22 attacks on Sunday the 28th in January a few weeks ago, um, when Iranian-backed militants killed U.S. soldiers and injured dozens others, it was a direct provocation against a U.S. military base. So do they seek a larger regional escalation? And what would their objective or what would the benefit in that be for Iran? Look, Iran's major strategy for now is to pressure the United States uh, to do two things. The first, is, the first goal is to pressure the United States to withdraw from the Middle East. I can see the attacks on the U.S. forces in Iraq and the attacks on, on the U.S. forces in Syria in this line. They want to keep pressure on the United States, keep harassing the U.S. forces, keep attacking the U.S. forces so that the Biden administration would be persuaded to leave the Middle East. That's their first goal. The second goal is to pressure the United States to pressure Israel to stop elimination of Hamas. That's, that's how I see 
even the recent attack on the U.S. base, US base in Jordan, which resulted in the killing of three American forces and wounded, I think, 25 or more uh, U.S. soldiers. That is their grand strategy to, to either kick out the, the United States from the Middle East and to pressure Israel to stop elimination of Hamas. And do you think the Biden administration responded appropriately in their strategic attacks against these key Iranian-backed militants in Iraq and Syria, or should they be doing more directly against the Iranian regime? Well, I believe the U.S. response to the Iranian regime's aggression has not been adequate so far. And, and that's including the, the recent bombing campaign against the Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, and all, also uh, Houthis in Yemen by the, by, by the United States. Why I don't think this is adequate, because in the Iranian grand scheme, which was to establish the ring of fire and also the axis of, of uh, uh, resistance, all these, proxy, all these proxies are cannon fodder. So hitting the proxies is not going to affect the regime itself. Remember, the regime is totally unpopular in Iran, does not have legitimacy, and it's extremely sensitive to the loss of Iranian lives. They don't care about Hezbollah lives. They don't care about Hamas lives. And they don't care about Houthis lives because they are cannon fodder. And that's why they are not going to be deterred. At this moment, the Iranian regime suffers from several crises, from economic crisis, from social crisis, political crisis, environmental crisis, and all these impacts the, uh, the uh, regime's legitimacy. If Iranians die in the battlefield, this will probably become the tipping point, and this way the regime collapses. So if Biden administration hits the IRGC bases inside Iran, if the Biden administration hits the Islamic Republic inside Iran, the regime may collapse. Mm. And do you think that the aggression on the part of Iran might push Saudi Arabia to normalize with Israel? We see these talks of some sort of a security agreement with the United States involving, you know, the question of Israel up in the news again this week, which was kind of the talks before October 7th. So do you think this might push Saudi Arabia to some sort of a an agreement with Israel and the United States, or is that Palestinian question still going to hinder any hope of normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Well, I don't think this is going to stop Saudi Arabia to normalize its relationship with, with Israel, but it would certainly postpone it. Why I think like that? Because it's really in the interest of Saudi Arabia to normalize its relationship with Israel, because the bigger threat to Saudis is not Israel. It's the Islamic Republic and it's, it's, it's proxies that they fund and they also harass Saudi Arabia. As I mentioned earlier, this whole proxy story, this whole proxy wars was set up 45 years ago, not only for Israel and the United States. Saudi Arabia was, was the target. So Saudis understand this and they know that Iran under the Islamic Republic will remain a threat as long as the regime remains in Tehran, it remains as a threat to Saudi Arabia. So it's in the interest of the Saudis to normalize the relationship with, Iraq, with, with Israel. And I think this will happen. Look, I understand that Palestine question is still matter to, to Saudis, but this is not going to be a big obstacle to the normalization with uh, the normalization between Saudis and, and Israel. I think it will happen in the long run. I, I, I cannot give you a time frame for that, but I can say that this is going to ha happen. Why? Because Iran remains the number one threat in the Middle East. As long as Iran pursues to obtain nuclear weapon, which is a big threat not only to Israel, but also to other regional countries, especially Saudi Arabia, as long as Iran sponsors terrorism in the region, that remains the uh, number one threat to Saudi Arabia. Israel is not a threat to Saudi Arabia. Actually, it has never been a threat to Saudi Arabia, but now we understand that, Saudis understand that number one threat is Iran, and they have to normalize relationship with Israel to counter this threat.
Amazing. Well, thank you, Farhad, for all that wonderful and comprehensive perspective. And there'll be a lot of stories to follow. You know, Iran's continued aggression, potential pact between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States, and some sort of security agreement to counter um, Iranian aggression. So we'll continue following all these stories here on the Fearless Project podcast. Farhad, it was wonderful having you. Where can our, our guests, our listeners, our viewers, where can they follow you and your work? Uh, well, well, I'm active on, on X, formerly Twitter. Uh, most of the time they can, they can follow me. I mean, I, I, most of the time I share my, my write-ups in there. When I publish somewhere, I share it in there. If, if they are willing to, they can follow me on Twitter and they can see my, my latest uh, posts. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Farhad. And for everyone listening or viewing, you can follow the Fearless Project podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or here on YouTube. And I will see you next week. Thank you, Farhad. Thank you very much, Dominic.